Hallelujah. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on to the God who kept you from revival last year online, to the God who brought you to revival in the building. Come on, if you're watching online, come on, give God praise that that same God who was with you approximately 365 days ago has been your sustainer, your keeper, the lifter of your head has been the one to prop you up on every week and lean inside is the God who restores your health, is the God who walks with you through the valley of the shadow of death. That has been the God who has kept us over the last 365 days. Come on, can you give God thanks and praise and glory and honor? Hallelujah to your name, God. You are a matchless Savior. There is none like you in all of the earth. And God, we say hallelujah. Hallelujah to your name. We bless your name. Can you do this with me for 30 seconds? For 30 seconds. Can you not be dependent on the preacher or the praise team? For 30 seconds. You know your testimony. You know your story. You know what God has done for you. And don't take nobody else to tell your story. Come on, not for cliche, but just for 30 seconds. Begin to open up your own mouth and tell God, thank you. Come on, come on, come on. Press your way. It's not about the music. It's not about the preacher. It's not about the environment. It's your story. It's your testimony. It's what the Lord has done for you. Come on, press your way into the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we thank you. God, we bless you. To an audience of one, to an audience of one, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. There are a lot of churches that can praise. There are not a lot of churches that can worship. The fact that we are in a worshiping congregation. Hallelujah. Just for being God. I was sitting there thinking about the last time I preached at a church and I did it on a cane. I could barely walk. And so when I tell you, not only am I standing here, but in heels. I didn't require a wheelchair through the airport. Your story is your story. And don't let any demon or devil in hell steal your worship and your praise because only you know what you've been through. Amen. Amen. Would you help me give God thanks and praise for Pastor Mike? Come on. Give God thanks for him. Amen. I am thankful for a brother who takes sabbatical. I'm also thankful for Pastor Lakeisha. Come on, give God thanks and praise for her. Amen. The other Pastor Mike, amen. We give God thanks and praise. 
this entire family for the ministry that they are doing in this place. You may have your seats. I do not take it lightly. Not only have I been invited on tonight, but also I do not take it lightly that it's been for revival. Now, where we probably will run into a problem, uh, and I do like to get in trouble. I do preach so I don't get invited back. Amen. Praise the Lord. And that's the beauty as a woman pastor. You like I got a church to go home to. Hallelujah. Amen. That ain't everybody's story, but but it's mine. But I I am thankful. Um, I warn you because the notion of revival historically is the concept that some outside preacher ought to come and inspire you to lean into God. And I think if the last two years have taught us anything, it's that you cannot be dependent on any outside entity to stir up what is already within you. So my job today is really to encourage you to fan the flame that is within you. It is not my job because I'm going to get on a plane and go back home. And these amazing preachers, Dr. Goodman, Dr. Faison going to come after me, and I know that, that each will have a role and a part, but I felt so deeply compelled tonight that this is, is designed for you to courageously fan the flame that is already within you, which is your responsibility to keep hot, even when it's down to an ember. I recognize that uh, it has been a difficult day in New York. We offer up prayers and compassion and empathy, uh, certainly to those who were a part of the incident that took place. We also offer up sympathy to those who witness from afar. I was talking with Pastor Lakeisha prior to this. It's just so much layered trauma. And I don't want to jump to the story of the cross and not acknowledge that there's been a lot of trauma along the way. And so, in that spirit, I just want to share a little Sunday school lesson with you on a Tuesday night. Amen? Amen. We, we, you're going to work tonight. I probably ain't tell you that when I came. You're going to work tonight. So you don't need your Bible. Amen. But we're going to walk through a text. Um, this Lenten season, I've been spending time with Peter. Um, been walking with Peter, that you can be favored and flawed. And I want to look at that tonight um, as we jump into the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Uh, if you would stand in reverence to the reading of God's most holy and gracious Word. A couple of passages of scripture, and again, our focus tonight um, will be primarily on Peter. But Mark chapter 14, I want to begin at verse 26. I'm going to read all the way down through verse 42, but we're going to have a good time tonight. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us lean and listen in to the word of God. Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 26. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all, somebody say all, all, fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Here come Peter. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I am not all. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others <laughs> said the same. Now, here comes the test. 
Here's where the night gets started. Then they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus and his disciples sat, said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not my will, your will be done. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you still asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation, but the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same, and when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say, and returning a third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is, be is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us go. Rise and let us go. For a few moments, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to preach from the thought, be gracious, I'm a piece of work. Be gracious, I'm a piece of work. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Come on and pray with me. Awesome, mighty, gracious, loving, and always faithful God, we pause today because I need you. I cannot do this work without you. Would you arrest my mind and give it laser-like focus? Would you tether me to you tightly that the Holy Spirit that is within me would rise tall and strong? May I be reminded that I am here to impress no one. I am here to be used by you. Somebody needs to hear what you have to say. So get me and my ego out of the way. Help me to listen and to lean into what you say. And not if this is done, but when this is done. Be so careful to give your name all the thanks, all the praise, all the glory, and all of the honor. It's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. We do pray, ask, believe, receive, and give thanks. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shout out to those who are watching online. We are thankful that you have tuned in and thankful to those who have pressed their way into the building tonight. Be gracious. I am a piece of work. <sighs> Soundtracks make movies. The right song at the right time really sets the atmosphere for what is trying to be conveyed. Have you ever noticed that in the midst of movies when bad news is being delivered, there is a score, as they call it, that begins to seep in to make the moment a little bit more palpable and digestible? All of us know these songs at very particular points in the soundtracks that make the movie. In 1990 classic Boomerang, when Angela says to Marcus, love should have brought you home last night. <laughs> we all know Tony Braxton. Love should have brought you, brought you home last night. It should have been with me. We don't even sing like that, but we just want to pretend like we Tony. Amen. Think about that movie, Waiting to Exhale. Come on here. Yes, there's that shoot, shoot by Whitney, but there is that not gonna cry. Come on here. When Angela Bassett is setting that call fire. That just encapsulates the moment. Or my personal favorite, I hope you won't leave me hanging, but when Effie is told she can no longer be in the group, and I am telling you, 
Even though the rough times are showing. Oh, y'all just gonna leave me hanging, okay. It's the best thing, it's the best thing. It's cool, I get it, it's my first time here, amen. Might be my last. But listen, music makes the story come alive. But there are those moments where the music fades. As much as music speaks to the moment, when the music fades, reality hits. I think about in 2 Kings chapter 3, there's a scripture there where it is prophesied that, that the gentlemen will be able to win the battle if they fill the valley floor full of ditches. And when the work becomes too slow and too difficult for them to complete the task, they call for a minstrel to come and play because there's nothing like doing chores on Saturday morning to the right music. But at some point, the music fades. I'm reminded of Psalm 139 when the music had faded for the people of Israel and these words where they are asked, uh, 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 sing us one of the songs of your land. How can we sing the songs of the Lord when the music on life has faded from abundance? To wilderness. It's what you do when the music fades in life. It's what you do when there's no praise team to take home with you and you have put your favorite song on repeat and it is no longer palpable to the spirit because you are being pressed but not crushed persecuted but not abandoned, still struck down even if I'm not destroyed. It's like all of life's foot is on my neck. When pink slips go out, the music fades. When your money doesn't add up right, the music fades. You can be singing a, a song in the shower at the top of your lungs till you feel a lump in your breast and all of a sudden everything stops because the music has faded. What do you do when you sit around with 12 of your disciples and have a meaningful moment of breaking bread and drinking wine and then verse 26 arrested me like never before and then they sang a hymn and the music faded. You can sing great is thy faithfulness and life is tough, but then the music fades. Your character is tested when the music fades. Your promise is tested when the music fades. Your life remains in jeopardy of, of, of your faith saying one thing, but your reality saying another because the music has faded. And I came to tell somebody tonight, with all you have survived, with all you have been through, if the music has faded, baby, be gracious to yourself. It's not a word we hear often in the church. Be gracious to yourself. We talk a lot about God's grace. And we talk a lot about being gracious towards one another, but, but a lot of us don't ever hear God whisper, be gracious to yourself. These are hard times, baby. Be gracious to yourself. You have survived two years of a pandemic. Be gracious to yourself. 
the, the notion of where you are in your cancer diagnosis. Be gracious to yourself. Somebody broke your heart. Be gracious to yourself. You done made it this far with a dime and a nickel. Be gracious to yourself. You live in a city where someone shot up in, in the midst of a, of a car. Be gracious to yourself. You trying to raise the money the best way you know how. Be gracious to yourself. You trying to serve in ministry the best way you know how. Be gracious to yourself. They don't know what it took you to get up and sing. God is faithful, but be gracious. Be gracious to yourself. Tonight's more of a Bible study than a revival, but it's all good. I, I, I want to walk through this text because this text does a couple of things that have blessed me in this season. That, 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 that there are three reasons why I should be gracious with myself. Watch this. But there are four ways the text shows us how to be gracious with ourselves. And I'm more interested in you walking out with the how than just the inspiration to do so. Number one, you can be gracious with yourself because Jesus already knows your weakness, your shortcoming, and where you go mess up. He already knows. It's right there in verse 27. It said, all will fall away. And I get it. You are that one person who is as confident as Peter that, that you would be the one to stand tall and you would be the one to hold on. But the text says, unless you are the exception to the rule, last I checked, all was all. And there are going to come some times in your life where your faith is tested and the promise you made is put on the chopping block. And God said, you can be gracious with yourself because everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody is going to mess up sometime. It's crazy as you look at this, that text, all will fall away. It's actually a reference, Pastor Lakeisha, to Mark chapter 4 when Jesus tells the parable of the four soils. He's not talking about the first soil which falls on uh, of the ground and the birds pick it up. Not talking about the third soil, that's where the thorns and the thistles get with it. Not talking about the fourth soil, that's the one that actually grows. But it's actually a reference to the second soil which falls on rocky ground. Watch this, the text says in Mark chapter 4 that, 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 that the harvest grows up with joy. Watch this, but their roots aren't as deep as they thought because it's on rocky ground. I came to tell the most faithful of us that you don't really know your faith until you find out how deep your roots go. And you can testify that my roots go deep. You can testify, I know God gonna keep me. You can testify, I know God's gonna make a way. But baby, when your life is on the line, you learn that what you thought was deeply rooted is in fact on rocky ground. But you have grown the most from the areas where your roots were short. You have not grown the most from where it's been easy. You've not grown the most from where everything has worked out. You have not grown the most from where it has been convenient. But you have grown in the rocky places of life where you are adamant that my roots run deep. And God showed up and said, baby, baby, baby. You can tithe till your pink slip come in and your roots ain't as deep as you thought they were. You can tell God how faithful you're going to be to serve until somebody in the church tells you no. And then you find out how deep your roots really go and if your gift is committed to God or if your gift gets so easily offended by somebody saying the house ain't in line with what you're hearing. Everybody's confident of deep roots till you hit rocky ground. And the text says all of us 
are going to be that soil. And I know we love to preach it. The preacher tell you, you got to be the fourth soil. But, but Jesus is saying, but most of us, <laughs> most of us got real shallow roots. He says, all are going to fall away. All are going to deal with this. And, and part of the challenge, watch this, is that we have been reared in our DNA that not being perfect has consequences to our very life and being. As an African American, you were reared in a tradition of perfection, watch this, not because of the Bible, but because your ancestors knew that your imperfection could cost you your life. They knew that if you crossed the grass on the wrong person's lot, you could be strung up by a tree. They knew that if you whistled at the wrong person at the grocery store, watch this, they conditioned it around religion because they felt that religion would keep us tight and keep us intact. But I came to tell you that your ancestors did it to keep you safe, but what they did to keep you safe several years ago is what's causing you to lose your mind in this season because you are trying to live up to unrealistic expectations. You are human. And this thing called life is hard. And previous generations, uh, 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 Charles Anthony Bryant shared with me uh, a couple weeks ago, he was traveling in, in the Carolinas on tour. And he said, Seemed like a nice town, he said, but I didn't know if it was a sundown town. In 2022, you still don't know if it's a sundown town. You still don't know if the roots that are within the DNA of racism are deeply embedded in a way that even if you're not doing nothing wrong, the very fact that your skin has been kissed by the sun is an assault to the fact that you are walking with joy. And I came to tell somebody, you don't have to be perfect. Jesus said, all, all going to fall away. This all going to fall away. But then watch this number two. I can be gracious with myself because Jesus still has a plan despite my disappointment. Oh, that's good news. That's good news right there. That despite my mess up, despite my failure. I am thankful for verse 28. Verse 28, after he says you're going to fall away, he says, but after I have risen, after you have messed up, I'm going to go ahead of you into Galilee. So even after that thing fails on your watch, I still have already gone into your future and I have already made concession for your past. I need you to know, be gracious because I'm already working that thing out. I have had to learn that the most uncomfortable place you will ever be is the space between what you prayed for and it coming to pass. It is the most uncomfortable place you will ever be. Y'all, several years ago, I prayed this very dangerous prayer. Make me effective. And since I asked God to make me effective, my life has been ripped open and torn apart because effectiveness, that prayer is going to cost me something and I am uncomfortable and is there anybody who can testify that yes, I'm on my way to what I prayed for, but it hurts and I never thought I would pray like this and I never thought I would cry like this and I never thought it would cost me like this, but I am in the spirit space between what I asked for and God giving it. And the truth is you wouldn't have had to ask for it if you were already ready to receive it. God would have just 
set it in your lap. But can I go here? But you prayed for this. You prayed for God to use you. You prayed for God to make you the first woman. You prayed for God to do something brand new in your life. And God said, I'm glad to do it. But you can't do it like you are. Watch this. And so I need you to fail on some things. I know we like to say, you know, all, all things do work together for the good. And I know God can do all things but fail. But that's God. God has me fail. So God can show me I made concession for your failure before you knew it. So, you can be gracious with yourself because Jesus already knows your weakness, failure, shortcoming. Be gracious with yourself because Jesus still has a plan despite my disappointment. Number three, I can be gracious with myself. Watch this. This one was big because my own intentions were not malicious. Now, we got some petty betties. Got some people who like drama and stir up drama. And they reside with drama. But there are some of us, watch this, who make promises with pure hearts when the heat is not on. It is so easy to make a promise when it's not you. It's easy to make a promise when the heat's not on. How many of us ha 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 have had friends say to us, well, girl, if it was me, I would have X, Y, and Z. But, but watch this. But then life shows up, and they don't make those same decisions because it's real easy to tell other people how they ought to live and the promises they ought to make when it's not you. I believe with all my heart that the promise Peter made, I ain't going to leave you, bruh. Everybody else? Yeah. Not me. I believe he was sincere, and I believe if you and I were Peter, we would have stood on the exact same promise. Jesus, everybody else going to go, but it ain't going to be me. Jesus, everybody else going to have something to say, but it ain't going to be me. I am your boy. I cut off ears and cuss Negroes out for you. I need you to know I am your boy. But the promises you make God in a lily field is never tested in the lily field. The promise you make God in the lily field is tested at 11 p.m. at night in a dark garden. The promise you make God is never tested in front of the people. The promise you make God is tested in private when you got to figure out how you going to fess up to what it is that you did. The promise that you made to God when everything was going right and your money was good is not, it gets tested when your money falls short and you got more month than you got money. I came to tell you that many of us make promises with good intentions and God says, be gracious, baby, because you ain't even seen how I'm going to test you on the promise you say you're going to make. It's right there. Peter, I love you, but you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Be gracious with yourself, Peter. What you said in private has not been tested in public. Be gracious, Peter. The fanfare in public and dealing with other things in private, Peter, be gracious. I appreciate your confidence, but right now, Peter, with all you have survived, be gracious with yourself. Here it is. Four ways to be gracious. Four ways to be gracious. I've just come to a point in my preaching, if I don't tell you ways to do it, preaching falls flat for me. I intend to leave you 
with more questions than answers. First thing you got to do in being gracious with yourself is really just that space. It's not, it's not really written, but it's the space between verse 31 and verse 32, which is Peter's willingness to keep walking with Jesus despite the prediction you going to mess up. He goes from the Mount of Olives into the Garden of Gethsemane, and I think the way he does this is Peter builds on his weakness. It's tight. Here's the prophecy, Peter. You gonna mess up? Here's the prophecy, Peter. I know everybody else told you it's gonna be great, gonna be awesome. But at the end of the day, Peter, you gotta keep going. Build off of your weakness. Think about it like this. So many of us have weaknesses. Now, when we go into uh, these job interviews, they say things to us like, could you share with me some of your strengths and your weaknesses? And when they say to us, share with me some of your strengths and your weaknesses, we come up with this, Pastor Lakeisha. Well, one of my weaknesses is I'm an overachiever. I just overwork and I'm super committed to deadlines, but you're really not being honest about your weakness. You're simply just trying to spin it as a positive. When are you going to be honest about your weakness? Because God can't build on it till you're honest about it. When I, when I met Pastor Mike, it was like 2017 maybe, I was at Morehouse College in the College of Pastoral Leadership, and I asked him the same question I asked so many preachers. I said, I said, Pastor Mike, tell me your sermon prep process. He said, you don't want to know. <laughs> Amen. He said, you don't want to know. I said, no, I do. I want to know. I want to know your process. He says, uh, well, he said, I have a kind of non-traditional process, he starts to tell me. I'm with him because I have a similar process till he says this. But the only way I can preach like that is because I read all the time. <laughs> I know y'all don't know this. I struggle with reading. I've always struggled with reading. I've struggled with retention, comprehension, long-term focus. I should not say this in front of your amazing pastor, but I was an English major at Spelman College, but I can't read. <laughs> at least not well. <clears throat> but I'm my father's child. Ain't nobody gonna outwork me now. I might have a deficit. But nobody can outwork me. I remember as a kid, my mother, Charles, she got me hooked on phonics. They ain't work for me. I sat up there at that wicker desk. Did anybody have a wicker desk as a kid? And think, come on, poking you in the thigh, the little piece pop off. And she, you going to do these hooked on phonics. And I'm, I'm, they're not working, mama. I don't understand. I went off to Spelman as an English major of all things and struggled, never finished a book and I'm an English lit major. I'm not proud of this. Watch this. I'm, I'm making a point. It's my weakness. Want to partner that with, but all the preachers in my life who are my preaching mentors, watch this, read all the time, and they write manuscripts. Well, baby, if you're not a strong reader, then you're also not a strong writer. The only reason I made it through the undergraduate program was because I'm a preacher. So I could take two or three good illustrations within the book that I had likely heard and found the section and I could write it in a way that would be compelling because I'm a preacher, not because I retain the information. 
But what happened was I got with preachers who said, it's got to look this way. And I bought into an idea that successful preaching has to fit a very particular way, that I got to do it a very particular way. And I came to tell you that God said, baby, what you see as your weakness, I'm going to use as your strength. I don't want you tied to a manuscript. I don't want you to feel like you got to do it like everybody else I'm gonna use your weakness if you just keep moving forward it's that space between Peter hearing about his weakness but still choosing to move forward anyway be gracious you can be gracious to yourself And I am also brought to that 2 Corinthians where Paul says three times, think about Peter, three times I was given this thorn in my flesh, a weakness. And what does God say? I'm not taking it from you, but I'm going to build on your weakness and I'm going to turn your weakness into your strength. Be gracious because the challenges are designed for you to build on those, to show the glory of God. So many of us think the glory of God comes in the strengths. Baby, the glory of God comes when I am weak. I ain't got it. I ain't got no solution. I ain't got no problem. But I am willing to move forward to the place you are calling me to. I am willing to trust you, though it don't look like I want it to look. I'm willing to trust you when everybody says it got to look a particular kind of way. But I'm going to press forward. Build on my weakness. You can also be gracious to yourself with this one, number two. Be gracious with yourself by choosing vulnerability with the right people. I'm going to say that again. Be gracious with yourself by choosing vulnerability, but here it is, with the right people. In this passage of scripture, they sing the hymn, go down to the Mount of Olives. They are having their time together. Jesus tells them, all going to fall away. Don't worry. All going to fall away. You're all going to mess up. And the text says he takes those 12 with him. And then it says, then he identifies his inner circle of Peter James and John, and takes them further into the presence of what he's going through. Now, I need to say this. All 12 saw him heal. All 12 saw him feed 5,000. All 12 saw the lame walk, and all 12 saw blinded eyes open. Watch this. But there are people who only want to rock with you when they see all the great accomplishments. Here it is. Here it is. But they can't handle you on the days you don't have it. Jesus identifies 25%. Three people. And watch, watch what he says to the three. This this is raw, y'all. He says, uh, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You know what he's saying? I ain't got it today. There are nine others who love it when I'm at the height. There are nine others who can get with me as long as everything's going well. But on the days I don't have it, watch this, everybody can't handle me. There are some of us who keep calling family members on the days when you need to identify your inner circle and they say something to you like this, well, you say you a Christian. You running up to that church every two seconds, where your church now? 
because you are sharing with people who cannot handle you on your worst day. You are sharing with people who are attracted to your lights but don't understand the cost. It takes you to show up just a little bit and I came to tell somebody, stop being vulnerable with everybody but you ought to be able to be vulnerable with somebody. And I know your mama told you don't talk to nobody. Your mama told you hold it and treasure it in your heart. But there ought to be at least one person in your life you ain't got to be nothing with. You ain't got to show up on being on top of the world. You can say I ain't got it today. The other week. I had had a terrible night. I was home in bed. I had cried all night. And I don't mean cried like, come on. I'm talking about, somebody know what I'm talking about. Two boxes of tissue in the bed. The tissues are wrapped inside of the tissues, inside of the tissues, inside of the tissues, inside of the tissues. You ain't really cried. Come on, sis. Till you know about the big balls. Come on, wrapped around. Cause you, cause, cause, come on, you can't breathe. You come on, your nose is clogged, your eyes are puffy. And on that day, my girlfriend knew something was wrong. And she came and busted in my house and picked me up off the floor. There's a lot of people who can't even get in my house to see me in that condition, let alone I am her pastor, but she could take me at a low moment and she can also take me at high moments. And the test for most of us is you keep sharing with people who are attracted to your shine, but not the people who are willing to pick you up off the floor when life has been disappointing, when failure has seemingly had the last word. Where are the people be vulnerable? with those people because you can be gracious. They don't judge him. If Jesus was honest about how bad it was, why can't you be honest about how bad it is? And notice, yes, Jesus has his prayer time, but Jesus also says to some people, some flesh and blood, this thing is harder than I thought it was going to be. You come to points in the journey of faith where that day you gave your life to Christ, you never imagined you would be dealing with what you're dealing with. Maybe you're like me, but I did all the things right. I did. I carried the one. I did all the things I was supposed to do. And now life And the least I can do is not just have that honest conversation in prayer, but God says, this is why I send you friends. This is why I send you people. This is why I send you folks who are not family, but are like family. And you won't utilize those people in your life. You either share it with everybody or you share it with nobody. And God said, but I put a small remnant can handle you in a low place. Number one, you can be vulnerable. I mean, excuse me, you can be gracious with yourself by building off your weakness. Number two, you can be gracious with yourself by being vulnerable with the right people. This is the one I like the most. Be gracious with yourself because you are human. Be gracious with yourself because you are human. There are two episodes of humanity happening in this text that are really important. Number one, because Peter is human, he keeps falling asleep. It's not that he doesn't trust God. It's not that he doesn't want to show up for God. It's not that that, that he wants to fail Jesus in some way. Here it is. He is human. 
And baby, you need sleep. I, I, I always say on Holy Week, by the time I get to Thursday, I can barely keep my own eyes open during this time. Peter is human. And I'm trying to figure out if Peter is human, why can't you be? Then we got Jesus, fully human, fully divine. Watch this. We keep modeling ourselves off of a Savior who was 100% human and 100% divine. The mere fact that he is 100% divine means he can turn away some temptations I can't. No, real talk. Y'all can laugh about it if you want to. Jesus is 100% human, 100% divine. I am 310% human in this body. I get tired. I get weak. I fall into temptation. I don't know if I'm going my left from my right. It happens. We are human. You are not expected to be superhuman. You ain't nothing but human with the Holy Ghost on the inside, but it ain't 100%. I don't know about you, but what happens with me is, you know, Jesus' mind is fixed. Lord, if this cup is not for me, may it pass from me. <laughs> Charles, you already know. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. What is you doing? <laughs> what is you doing? I'm trying to understand what is going on because in the midst of all I'm dealing with, my amygdala says one thing and the back of my brain says another and the thing on the side says another and then I got to assemble this inner committee and the inner committee is saying, well, what is we going to do? We got a problem right here. And the one said, wait, well, this is what we need to do. No, you go sit down somewhere. We going to end up in jail doing what you suggested, but we do have to do something else. Well, I was thinking it was a good, I mean, let's be real. You are here human. Your childhood issues get in the way. Your fear about the future gets in the way. Your concern about what you did in the past gets in the way. Human. And I'm trying to figure out if Jesus carried the weight of the cross, why you keep carrying why do you keep carrying what Jesus said, but I knew you was human. I knew you was going to mess up. I knew this wasn't going to turn out the way you wanted it to. When I came to my church, uh, it was a clergy killer. 18 pastors ahead of me. And in only in like 170 years. And I remember saying to the Lord, you probably don't know this, the church literally, the day they called me, Probably about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. By 2 a.m., the church had been struck by a bolt of lightning and had burned completely to the ground. So I'm looking at a church that's a clergy killer. Thank you, sis. Just got struck by a bolt of lightning. The church edifice is completely destroyed by fire. The only thing left is a bell and a cornerstone. I had no intentions of taking this church. God clearly. So otherwise, and I remember saying to God, this is the start of a good story. I hope it ends well. But I'm human. Yes, I got a prayer life. Yes, I got you with me. And that's what's crazy because the condition that Jesus is actually dealing with is a condition called hematidrosis. It is a condition that shows up in weightlifters. That when you lift dead weight at extreme levels, it causes the hematidrosis to send those gray drops of blood to the outside. Watch this. As much as Jesus was divine, hematidrosis says, baby, you are human. But if Jesus endured the hematidrosis because he was carrying the weight, 
How many of us just keep carrying the weight? You keep carrying the weight. You keep carrying the weight of what didn't work out. You keep carrying the weight of what didn't manifest. You keep carrying the weight of your mistakes. And Jesus says, you are human. I carried that weight for you. Put it down. The other week, I was praying about something. The Lord said, you don't like it when this happens. The Lord said, give it to me. Come on, like a parent. And it's crazy how we pray for stuff, Reverend Alicia, how we pray for stuff. And the minute God says, give it to me, you be like, uh-uh, mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. Because I know if you take it, that's it. And we love to pray about stuff, but double dutch with God on whether we really want stuff. And God said, baby, you are human. Some of these things you are carrying, I need you to turn over to me. Be gracious with yourself. Last point, I'm done. Number one, you can be gracious to yourself by just building off your weakness Moving forward in your failure, acknowledge your shortcomings. God still knows your work in progress. Number two, be vulnerable. I mean, be gracious to yourself by choosing vulnerability with the right people. Be gracious with yourself by embracing your humanity. But then there's this one. Be gracious with yourself because this is a process. It's a process. You know, we live in a day and age where we don't want the process. We just want the end result. We just want everything to be easy. But God says, this is a process. Now, what's interesting about the text is the text takes place in the Garden of Gethsemane. I've been to the Garden of Gethsemane, and what is mostly there are olive trees. They are spread all throughout the garden with these very large trunks. And and in fact, the garden, the portion of the garden where they believe Jesus was, it's blocked off with, 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 with all of this railing to keep you so that you can look in where Jesus was. But in the middle of these gardens are all of these olive trees. Gethsemane is the place where oil is made. Gethsemane is the place where the olives are pulled from the trees and there is a shaking, it's a part of the process. There is a beating, it is a part of the process. There is a pressing and it is part of the process. And many of us want the oil, but we don't want the process that it takes to get the oil. We want the oil, but we don't want the pressing. We want to be comfortable where we are. We want the oil, but we don't want the beating because we don't want people to come against against us. We want the oil, but we don't want the pressing where it seems everything is coming down on us. But Gethsemane is the place where your oil gets its cost. Now this is what blew my mind. I'm going to take my seat. Notice I said Gethsemane is the place where oil gets its cost. But on the other side of Calvary, is where oil gets its value. Cost and value are two totally different things. There is the cost that you're going to fall away. There is the cost that you will betray me. There is the cost that you will deny me. And as you go through your Gethsemane experience, it is simply racking up the cost. The cost is literally all of the items, the cost, if you will, that it takes for the oil to be produced. But the oil doesn't make a profit off the cost. The oil makes the profit off the value. Okay, okay, okay. I'm in New York. I'm in New York. Uh, There's the cost of a Louis Vuitton. 
And then there's the value. There's what you actually pay for it. The challenge with most of us is that when the cost gets to a certain point, we want to drop out of the race before the value is assigned to the cost that was spent for us to be able to produce oil. Notice the last part of that text is after Jesus says, you going to betray me. After Jesus says that 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 uh that uh that that, that you're going to deny me. After Jesus says you keep falling asleep. Watch what Jesus says to you, Pastor Lakeisha in verse 42, he says, let's go. I came to tell somebody that the cost is what is found in the garden, but the let's go in spite of my difficulty, in spite of my downfall, in spite of my failure, in spite of how I messed up, that's where my value comes to be. And the truth of the matter is that the church was not built on just the cost of Peter's failure, but it was built on his value to keep teaching and preaching despite what he went through, despite his failure, despite his mix-up, despite where he went wrong, despite where he didn't meet, to, didn't believe Jesus. It's not the cost, baby. It's the value of your oil. And I came to tell you that there is the cost you are paying now, but it is correlating to the value of what is on the other side because you don't let anything stop you. You are gracious to yourself. You understand that the value of the oil on my life cannot be quantified by the cost of how I behave in a garden. Is there anybody here who knows? People will judge your cost. But God said, I want to know your value. There's the cost of what this meant to us. But the distance between your Gethsemane and your Calvary is the value of your oil. People will always judge your cost. Watch this. But the right folks will never question your value. People will judge what you had to push through. People will judge what they think they know about your story. People will judge you in the Gethsemane of your moment. People will judge you because you denied him. People will judge you because you question him. People will judge you because you say, God, I know you can do anything, but I don't know if you can do this. People will judge you because you went to church, but you still had doubts and worries. And God said, but when you get on the other side of this thing I'm doing in your life, there will be a value assigned to your oil and no demon or devil in hell will be able to stand up against what I'm trying to do in your life. I didn't say shout for the cost. I said shout for the value, that there is a value in what God is doing on my life. God will not waste. God will not waste your Gethsemane. God wants to see if you can stand up to the cost so the value can be assigned. I need you to be gracious because when God added up the cost, your failures were already in the mathematical equation. What didn't work out was already in the mathematical equation, your failure, your fumble, your question was already in the mathematical equation. God said, and when I get down to the end of the bottom line of what it is that I am calling you to do, there is a value. So I literally need someone tonight who has been beating themselves up over how it's not working or what didn't work or an area in your life where you felt your failure defined you. And tonight, God sent me here to say, baby, let's go. 
Rise. Let's go. You're still trying to figure it out? Get up. Let's go. That statement implies that there is a future beyond your failure. There is a future beyond your disappointment. There is a future beyond the promise that you made to God with great intentions, but were unable to fulfill when the rubber met the road. I look back at things I did when I was younger. I didn't know what I didn't know. Make these audacious promises to God about what we going to do. And how we gonna... Life hits. A boo hits. The job you always wanted with the paycheck you wanted hits. And it can derail us from the promises we made with good intentions. But I hear the Lord say, I need somebody to be gracious with themselves. Watch this, because I am gracious with you. Can I be honest? I think many of us are harder on ourselves sometimes than God is on us. I'm not making excuses for where we fall short. I'm not making excuses for our sin. I'm saying it's a part of life. You are human. I want to know, and God wants to know, when you're going to stop beating yourself up and decide to move forward, let's go. I need somebody to get a let's go in their spirit. That despite what it is, let's go. Despite how it didn't work out how I wanted, let's go. Because the value is not found in Gethsemane. It's just the cost that's found there. The value is in you choosing to move forward despite what has not worked out. Let's go. And God says to somebody, you've been sitting in your Gethsemane long enough. I don't need some big clothes to make you shout and run around. I don't. Because I'm being gracious with myself. What I need is you to understand. Nothing separates you from the love of God. Nothing will be wasted. That's why your oil has value. Because nothing will be wasted. No failure will be wasted. No heartache will be wasted. No disappointment will be wasted. No tear will be wasted. No prayer will be wasted. No challenge will be wasted. No trial will be wasted. No lack of resources will be wasted. Nothing that you have been through will be wasted when the final calculation is determined not for the cost of your oil, but for the value. Baby, for some of you, there are folks who are still living and breathing because you didn't give up. There are folks who are still making it because you didn't throw in the towel. And God says, baby, this picture is bigger than you can see. Be gracious. Be gracious. Be gracious. I hope you get that in your spirit. I wish there was a deeper way to say it. I wish there was a more powerful way to say it. Would you just do this with me? Turn to your neighbor and tell them, be gracious. Turn to your neighbors. No, like really speak life to them. Be gracious. We're all going through a tough time. Be gracious. We're all surviving a pandemic. Be gracious. We're all living in a tough economy. Be gracious. We're all trying to figure out how to make it from one day to the next. Be gracious. Be gracious. Be gracious. And I pray you get that in your heart. I pray you get that in your spirit. Because the Lord says... The way revival really begins is not through an outside preacher who gets you excited. The way revival begins 
is you being gracious to yourself. God says, fan the flame as best you can, baby. Whatever you got, here it is, it's enough. Because you've never been where you are. You've never survived what you've survived. You've never endured what you've endured. And the truth is you never imagined it would look like this. But with whatever you got, fan in to the embers that are left because embers do start forest fires. Embers do turn into big fires. Today, be gracious with yourself. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen.